anyone alive this morning, alive and well? Good, good, good. Well, I bring you greetings from Manchester. Um, I don't know how many of you were here last time I was here. Anyone was here last time I was here? Okay, cool. How many of you have not seen me, don't know me, anything? Okay, great. Well, hi, my name is James. <laughs> James Letter and based in Manchester. And so uh, my parents are missionaries. <clears throat> So I'm half Nigerian and half Ghanaian. My dad is from Nigeria. My mom is from Ghana. My wife is from uh, Stockport. I was born in Liberia. I live in Manchester. So uh, we've been leading a ministry there called Prayer for some years now. And uh, in fact, I think it's 2009. And our passion, our heart is to see a prayer revolution across the body of Christ. Because we're convinced that every great move of God is often preceded by a great move of prayer. And so when you begin to see the people of God beginning to pray and see God in an intense way and not crisis driven, it's a sign that something is about to explode. Are you with me? Because a lot of people just pray when there's, you know, problems. And, you know, I often say, show me the person that can pray intensely without crisis. And I show you the person that's rightly aligned to handle the crisis when it arises. So we're going to go into the Word today because there's a Word stirring in my heart for your congregation and for what I believe the Lord is doing here. And so before we go into the Word, let's just pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for this place. I thank you for the various words that have been spoken here over the years. I thank you for what you're doing here. Lord, even as I speak, I ask that there will be an acceleration of your Word, that the Word of the Lord will run swiftly and be glorified in this territory, that every stronghold of darkness influence of the enemy that has been resisting, opposing, obstructing the word of God, the purposes of God, that it begins to crumble down in the name of Jesus, Father. Let every stronghold in minds be dismantled, every deception of the enemy be exposed, every oppression of darkness be lifted, Father, that even this morning as the word comes forth, there will be freedom and there'll be transformation, and there'll be an awakening of your fire within us afresh. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. Amen. Well, um, in the uh, first session, I was sharing about what I believe God has uh, called your congregation to, uh, and what I believe God is doing in this region. I believe something very significant of the assignment of God has been placed on this congregation. And when I say this congregation, don't just think about someone over there or maybe the person next to you. That's you, (laughs) if this is your home church. And I believe the assignment of God on this place is meant to impact this territory, this region. And so if that's going to be the case, then the battles that this church is going to have to fight in the spirit for the breakthroughs that God wants to release in this territory... Is anyone alive today? (laughs) Is anyone alive this morning? (laughs) There's some battles that some of you, not just some of you, this church is going to have to fight in order for the purposes of God in this region to advance. Okay? And in case you don't realize it, you're already in spiritual warfare. So it's good you are familiar with the enemy you're up against. (laughs) And it's good you're not ignorant of his devices. And your eyes are not blind spiritually. Because one of the ways the enemy functions effectively is in ignorance. When ignorance is a, darkness is a picture of ignorance. And we're told in uh, Ephesians that we don't just wrestle against principalities and powers, but against rulers of darkness. They function in that realm to cover the minds of people, even believers blind to the activities of the enemy. Now, we don't focus on the enemy, but when God has called us to do something and the enemy gets in the way, guess what? We kick him out. You don't medicate demons. You don't counsel demons. You kick them out. Are you with me? Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat and get to the other side. And they were obeying him, and all of a sudden, some demonic storm is stirred up. Okay, they're obeying Jesus, yet there's warfare coming against their obedience. The fact that you're in the place of obedience does not mean everything is going to be calm and peaceful. In fact, the fact that things are shaking does not mean you're not in the will of God. There are different types of storms, right? As long as you're not Jonah in disobedience, right? Because you could be in a storm because of your disobedience. But you could also be in a storm because of your obedience, 
And sometimes when you choose to obey God, as I believe this church is wanting to push into more of God, the enemy starts to stir things around. And you have to be spiritually intelligent to understand what you're dealing with and be able to use your weapons to resist the darkness. Now, we cannot be an army if you're not a soldier. If you don't know how to use your own weapons, then uh, we're in trouble because we, we can't really deal corporately with the darkness and the enemy as we're called to until each of us starts to take our position. Do you understand that corporately we have access to things of the spirit that we don't have access to individually? Do you understand that there is a corporate anointing that God has placed on this place. And if you don't key into what God is saying over this congregation, you become a liability and not an asset to the atmosphere. You drain life as opposed to release. Some people walk into a room and they drain life out of the room. Some people walk into a prayer room and their presence adds momentum to what is going, what goes in there. Are you a life drainer? Are you on the ads moment? Some Christians are milk Christians and some Christians are wine Christians. Milk Christians, milk gets bad with time, gets worse with time. Wine gets better with time. Are you a milk Christian or are you a wine Christian? Some people, the longer the years go by, the more miserable and horrible they become as a Christian. You've been a Christian for 30 years, but you're more miserable now than you were when you first gave your life to Christ. It's a sign that something is wrong. Because if you're really walking with God, you should draw closer to him. And actually, your character should be changing and reflecting his nature more and more. So, if you're truly walking with God, you should be more like Christ this year than you were two years ago. But if all your friends and all your church people look at you and you're more miserable, more horrible, more negative, and just a nasty person to be around as the years go by, you're not walking with Jesus. You've subscribed to a perverted form of Christianity. In fact, I said in the first service, if you're finding Christianity boring, it's because you've subscribed to the wrong version. The right version means you grow in joy, you grow in peace. It doesn't mean life is easy, but your character has changed. I tell you what, sometimes I ask, how many of you are married in this place? A challenge for you. This is going to be a hard challenge. When you get out of service, Ask your wife or your spouse, what are the areas of immaturity in my life? <laughs> and listen, listen. <laughs> Don't shut them down and start saying stuff. Just, just listen. Sometimes I ask my wife that. You know why? Because she knows me better than anyone else. So if I am becoming more like Christ, my nature should be changing and she should be able to tell. Have you ever bothered to check up on your spiritual progress? Are you growing? Or are you just doing religion? Because Christ does change us. You know that, right? So if you're not being changed, who are you fellowshipping with? It might not be Christ. If you're just singing in the songs and going to church and you're not changing, you should be bothered about that. And if you're not bothered about that, something is wrong. You know, in the natural hunger is a sign, when you're hungry, it's a good sign when hunger is stirred. So when you lose your appetite in the natural and you don't want to eat, that's a sign that you're sick. Some of you are spiritually sick. No appetite. You're coming, but you're dead on the inside. And you expect God to move. God is not just going to come because you showed up on Sunday. He's more impressed by your heart, not your words. And sometimes our hearts are so dead because we've been feeding on the Grammys and, and music and, and, and movies and De Disney Plus and Netflix and Instagram and Facebook and more movies. And I believe it's Super Bowl today or something. So your mind is not here. You're thinking about Super Bowl probably right now. Hello, somebody. Am I stepping on all your toes right now? Well, I'm going to do that and leave and Pastor Mark can sort out the, the mess. <laughs> Listen, God is concerned about your heart. And he wants you to be real in his presence. And what I'm trying to say is, God has called this church to some significant things for this region. That's beyond your congregation. Because 
your obedience as a congregation will impact the kingdom, the kingdom's advancement in the region. So because you as a church align more with God, things will break out in the region that you wouldn't even know about. But your yes has impacted God's advancement in the region. So that's why what I'm about to share is really important. Can you turn in your Bibles to um, Luke, excuse me, um, Luke 3. And then, in fact, let me just see. I think we might start with, in fact, you know what? Let's start with Matthew. Matthew, Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 1. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. He came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John came preaching in the wilderness. He wasn't preaching in the city. He wasn't preaching in a comfortable space. So the the motive of his preaching was not popularity. Because he made it difficult for people to come and hear him. So the fact that people were coming was not a secondary consequence of his charisma or his uh, speaking ability, or marketing skills. They didn't have Facebook or Instagram back, back then. So if people are coming, guess why they're coming? God is drawing them. You see, in the book of Acts, we see the church growing in an alarming rate, like so incredible rate, the way the church is growing. And some crazy things happen as the church is growing. Like Ananias and Sapphira, you know the story in Acts 5, they lied and they died. I mean, we're laughing now, but it wasn't funny back then. <laughs> Imagine how many people are lying in church today and not dying. They lie. This is the New Testament, not Old Testament. They lied and boom, they're dead, drop dead. So it's like, okay, how come they lied and they died? And, you know, the church is still growing. Because if you read the context, it says, great fear fell upon everyone. Of course, the fear of God is going to come when people start dropping dead for lying. (laughs) So people were scared to join them. But yet, you still read in the same chapter that their numbers grew. Do you see what I'm trying to say? If people are scared to join them and their numbers are growing, what's responsible for their growth is Holy Spirit. But in the American church, we have church growth without Holy Spirit. So the crowds are gathering. And oftentimes, it could be because of the oratory or speaking gift. The American church often, sometimes I observe it, even this affects the UK as well, is like we have come and worshipped at the altar of giftings. And we have exalted giftings, and we are mesmerized by people's giftings while the people are disconnected from God. Let me just shock you. You might not have heard this before, but listen. The power of God can flow in a direction contrary to the will of God. Didn't Satan come and tempt Jesus and say, if you are the son of God, what? Turn these stones to bread. So that was a temptation because Jesus could have done it. So let's just imagine he did it. The power would have flown through him to do something impossible. But that would have been contrary to the will of God. Okay, another example. What did God tell Moses to do? God told him to speak to the rock. What did he do? He struck it. Did the power flow? Yes. So the power of God can flow and God is grieved. The people could be blessed and the Holy Spirit is grieved. But the people are distracted because of the gifting and the power flowing. They think because of that, God is pleased. I'm trying to show you that the American church, as oftentimes, even the charismatic, you know, gymnastics that we have right now, the, the, char- the, the charismatic American Pentecostal church, sometimes we've stepped into a place of deception and not even known it. Because we have submitted ourselves, and it, sometimes it's out of ignorance and lack of discernment, we've come to a place where we are so in love with the gift We have disconnected from the giver of the gift, so we don't even know when the giver is grieved. 
Because you, be you could be in a service, seemingly God is moving, but the Spirit is grieved. So if you don't know the Spirit is grieved, could that be a sign of the fact that you're not close to Him? Because if I'm out with you with my wife, and my wife doesn't say a word, I should be, let's say we're talking, I should be able to pick up without her telling me if she's upset. Any, any married people in the room here? Your wife doesn't have to tell you she's upset for you to know she's upset, right? <laughs> I got an amen right here on the front. <laughs> you should be able to feel the vibes. You should be able to read. Are you with me? Because of the depth of intimacy. So other people may not even know something is wrong, but you know something is wrong. It's a sign of your closeness. So how can the Holy Spirit be grieved and you don't know? And he's meant to be in the same room as you. It means you're not close to him. And I'm trying to say we fall in love with giftings more than the giver of the gift. So John's preaching was drawing people, but it wasn't his gifting that was doing it. It was because he'd given himself to a lifestyle. He was a voice. And he, was a life, he lived a life of fasting and prayer. He gave himself to seeking God. Okay, let's keep reading. John, uh, Matthew 3, 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair and leather belt around his waist. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. Then all Judea, all the regions around the Jordan went out and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So this is a revivalist. Everyone say revivalist. John modeled what it looks like for us to carry that revival anointing. And one of the key characteristics of that we see in John's life was when people heard him preach, there was lots of repentance going on. There was conviction of sin. This is at the core of every true move of God, a spirit of conviction. And when John preached, he said people came from all over and they came into the desert. So the Holy Spirit mobilized them. Now, we know that John carried the spirit of Elijah. And um, Jesus gives us an insight into the workings of the spirit of Elijah. I believe in Matthew 17, 11, Jesus said to the disciples, Peter, James, and John, that Elijah has come, but he said Elijah is here. He was referring to John the Baptist. And then he made another interesting comment. He said, Elijah is coming. So there are three dimensions here. Elijah has come, Elijah is here, and Elijah is coming. So anyone heard the phrase, the spirit of Elijah? Now, let me just explain that. When we say the spirit of Elijah, we're not referencing, like, Elijah himself. I believe what we're actually referencing is a dimension in the Holy Spirit. Let me explain it this way. When Elijah lived on earth, he pursued God and was able to capture a dimension in God. And his lifestyle was able to express a dimension in God that no one else before him had ever captured before. Are you tracking with me? He called down fire from heaven. Before Elijah did that, no one else had ever done that before. Abraham never did that. Even Moses never did that. When Elijah, Elijah was translated. Do you understand this guy, Elijah, was a crazy? He was supernaturally translated. So standing right here, boom, one moment he's taken, he disappears by the Spirit. So Elijah was like a whole, no one had seen a human on earth that moved in the spirit like Elijah. Are you tracking with me? So when Elijah was taken up to heaven, because he modeled that dimension of the Holy Spirit so well, that dimension is God, in God was named after him. Are, are you tracking with me? So that dimension, is anyone alive in this? <laughs> shall I stop or shall I carry on? Okay, only these guys. Okay, I'll preach to these guys over here. Shall I stop or shall I carry on? The guys over here, you guys over here, is anyone alive on that side of the room at all? Okay, okay. I don't want to carry on if you're not, if you're not really wanting to hear me. Because I, would say, I, mean, I don't want to just keep talking if you're not tracking with me. I believe you came to church to hear from God, 
So I'm expecting an engagement from your heart right now. Forget about Super Bowl. Super Bowl, when, when is Super Bowl? I don't know. Is it today? <laughs> if you're thinking about Super Bowl right now, just clear that out of your mind. <laughs> and say, Lord, I repent and I receive your word right now, okay? I forgot where I was. Where was I? <laughs> Oh, Elijah, spirit of Elijah. So Elijah captured the dimension in God so well that he was taken up to heaven and that dimension was named after him. So when it says John carries the spirit of Elijah, it's not like he's taken a portion of who Elijah is. It really, what he's carried, because we know he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. So really, the spirit of Elijah that John is capturing is the Holy Spirit, but in the way Elijah modeled it. You're tracking with me? So Elijah has come. Elijah is here, and Elijah is coming. The spirit of Elijah really is, is the spirit of revival, because when he manifested on John, he was confronting the complacency in the culture. He was preaching intense messages that brought about conviction in the hearts of the people who heard him. So now, if you go to um, uh, Luke 3, we see different dimensions of the ministry of revival. Why am I sharing this? It's because I believe this congregation is called to model that spirit of Elijah in this region. And it's a spirit of revival. It's going to impact the territory. And so there are three manifestations of this spirit as we see it through the life of John. And we see this in Isaiah 40, but also it's quoted in Luke 3. So Luke 3, 4 says, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Okay, now this is where we're going. It's gonna, we're going to list these three things now from verse 5. Luke 3, verse 5. Every valley shall be filled. That's one. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. That's two. And, ev and the crooked places shall be made straight. That's three. And then the rough, uh, it says, uh, the, the rough ways smooth. And then it says, and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. So I want to I just touch on three dimensions of this spirit that has to manifest more in this congregation. One, the valleys have to be filled. When you fill in a valley, you're filling in the gap. That is standing in the gap. That is a picture of intercession. So one of the manifestations of the spirit of revival for this region is an intense spirit of intercession on this congregation. You cannot be here and part of this congregation and disconnect from the life of prayer at a personal level, but also at a corporate level. The spirit of, I say this in the, in the morning service, there is no such thing as a gift of intercession, nor is there a thing as a gift of prayer. Every single believer is called to be an intercessor. In fact, I want to say this, you are called to be a VIP in the spirit. You know what that means? A voice of intercession and prayer. In your DNA, God built in you a praying machine. But you're not aware of it because you've been on Disney Plus and Netflix for hours. But Jesus said in Luke 18, man ought always to pray. I'm trying to look for the speaker. Where's the speaker? In this? Oh, is it up here? Where's the speaker? Oh, there's the speaker. Okay. There's the speaker, right? That speaker ought always to release sound. That's a statement of its purpose. It's, it, it's, um, it's not just a suggestion. It's a declaration of what the designer intended when they created the speaker. It was built to release sound. So Jesus said, man, and by the way, that's woman as well, mankind. Man ought always to pray. So he built it in you to pray. So if you're not praying, you're malfunctioning. <laughs> you're not functioning according to design. So what is abnormal, the church has accepted as normal. And what is normal, the church has accepted as abnormal. So you have many prayerless Christians 
Who live their lives in the flesh? When you're prayerless, it's a sign of your pride. Because prayer is a sign of dependence on God. And prayerlessness is a sign of your independence. If Jesus had to pray so much, who are you to think you're okay with two minutes? Who do you think you are? If the Son of God is praying for seven hours, and somehow you think you're okay with two minutes? Jesus, 30 years ministration. Three and a half years uh, sorry, 30 years of preparation, three and a half years of ministration, over 2,000 years now of intercession. And you tell me intercession is only for the old ladies at the back of the church? Over 2,000 years and he's been doing it, and he's still doing it now? God himself does this. So this is a big deal in the heart of God. The ministry of intercession is going to mark any, any and every true revival movement. There is no second, is, it, there, there is no shortcuts. I believe it was Lane and Revenue that says revival delays because prayer decays. The pulpit can be a shop window to display our talents, but the prayer closet allows no showing off. And when I say prayer, I don't just mean you come to the corporate prayer meeting. I mean you yourself are praying at home. Because oftentimes the corporate prayer is struggling because the private prayer is non-existent. The corporate prayer will be stronger when your private prayer becomes as strong as it's meant to be. We are an army only when you're a soldier. So we are not co corporately effective to the uh, utmost of our abilities in the spirit or capacity if you are not effective on a private level of, you know, your calling in God. So we can go on to that for a while, but I'm going to stop there. So one, intercession. The, va the valleys have to be filled. They stand in the gap. The next thing is the mountains being brought low. That is spiritual warfare. You cannot be part of a revival movement and not understand the dynamics of spiritual warfare. The moment you decide to seek after God, especially contend for a move of his spirit, the enemy is going to try to resist you all he can. In fact, Spiritual warfare is not just something that's for some weird Christians that like waving flags. <laughs> By the way, I'm not against waving flags. <laughs> Wave all you want. I just want to say, spiritual warfare is not for the weirdos. Oh, yeah. And, and some Christians take you to the extreme. And, you know, it's like there's a demon in the cup of tea. There's a demon under their shoe. There's a, so I'm not, I'm not talking about just demon hunting everywhere as well. Are, are you tracking with me? There's a healthy balance of realizing that we're at war. We're not ignorant of the enemy, but we don't let him take over our whole mindset and thinking all the time. We live focused on Christ, and when the enemy gets in the way, we cast him out. But we're not ignorant of his ability. In fact, Jesus said, was it Luke 10, 19, that, you know, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and what? All the powers of the enemy. So Jesus himself says the enemy has powers. Are you aware the enemy has powers? The witches use the powers of the enemy. That's how they release curses and spells and bind people with all kinds of weird sicknesses. And Christians are not aware of that. And those on the dark side know how to manipulate the powers of darkness to their advantage. And we who are in light, we are sleeping while they're awake. Listen, I don't know if it's big here because I think we're in the south, right? So this might not be relevant. <laughs> but in Manchester and other parts of the world, we have an increase in Islamic population and they pray. So I say to our church, listen, the Muslims have a prayer culture and we have a prayer meeting. Prayer is powerful whichever kingdom you're in. There is no vacuum in the spirit. If we vacate, if, if we vacate our position of authority, something else is going to occupy it. If the witch is more submitted to Satan than you are to God, they would dominate the airways. Even though you have the authority, but they are more submitted to darkness, and you are supposed to be submitted to God, but there's areas of disobedience and rebellion in you. I mean, I use this illustration in the morning service. You see, we're, we sang it earlier about using the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful, but not just on any 
person's lips. You could call the name of Jesus and nothing happens. And another person called the name of Jesus and demons tremble and flee. And Philippians 2, do you know what Philippians 2 says? It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. You know the scripture, right? Do you know what that scripture doesn't say? It doesn't say at the mention of the name of Jesus. It says at the name. Everyone say at the name. So let's just imagine this is the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is a location in the realm of the spirit. So you are over here. You're not at the name and you're mentioning the name. You can mention the name all you want. As long as you're not at the name, nothing happens when you mention the name. Because when you step into the name, the scripture says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and are safe. So you have to be in the name. And to be in the name means you're under the government of the name. It means when you're under the government of the name, you cannot have unforgiveness in your heart. If you're under the government of your name, you can't just marry anyone, date anyone, spend your money however you want, watch whatever you want to watch. Because the government of the name influences your behavior. The government determines how you speak. You can't just curse someone out because you're upset. You're not under the government. You curse someone out one moment and then you're calling in the name of Jesus the next moment. The name is not going to be effective in your name, in your lips, because you're not at the name. Step into the name by submission to his authority and then he has government over your life and demons fear you to the degree to which you fear God. So if you're not submitted to God's authority, don't expect the demons to bow when you're calling the name of Jesus. You can sing and shout all you want. The demons are just there with you. In fact, the demons can also say the name of Jesus. Didn't they say that in the book of Acts? Paul we know, Jesus we know. Demons can say Jesus. They can, they can mention someone functioning under the spirit of divination. And by the way, that's happening a lot in America, in case you didn't realize. The spirit of divination and, you know, the counterfeit prophecy, which is so saying, the function in that spirit, they can say the name of Jesus and give you accurate words. Oh, yeah, you did this last week. You've got this in your house. You've got this. You got The fact that they're saying all that stuff does not mean it's from the spirit of God. They can be saying, the, they can be saying true things, but they're not functioning from the spirit of truth. You can be theologically correct and spiritually wrong. So someone can preach a sermon that you can't fault theologically, but they could be operating from another source. So discernment is not just by the scriptures, even though, yes, we're going to use the scriptures to discern the accuracy of what's being preached. It's also by spirit testing. So when you start to walk in the spirit, the spirit of uh, discernment is not the spirit of suspicion. It's a a gift of the spirit that enables you to test and decipher what spirit is functioning. And I'm telling you more than ever, we need the spirit of discernment in the church in America. Because there's so much deception being propagated, even on Christian media. And lots of people are just taking it in, not realizing they're coming under the government of a false spirit. And then that spirit starts to influence their thinking. Okay, I've gone off track completely. Let's come back. Let's come back. So, valley field is intercession. Mountains brought low is spiritual warfare. Crooked places made straight is repentance. Every true revival movement is going to have an emphasis on on repentance. That's why, you know, you have to be concerned when you listen to the hyper false grace message that undermines repentance. Oh, you don't need to repent. You've been forgiven already. You don't need to say, so why is Jesus asking the church to repent in Revelations then? <laughs> There's all kinds of, you know, there are all kinds of doctrines of demons that are spreading in the body of Christ right now. Yeah. How, do you realize, yeah. is it, there's a, I'm receiving an amen from back there, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out if people are alive in this room today. Is anyone awake in this place today? <laughs> if you're awake, just give me a shout. If, if you're definitely awake. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, you're there, you're there, okay. When is the Super Bowl again? <laughs> okay, let's forget about Super Bowl. I'm not really even into Super Bowl. Anyway, so, where was I? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, yeah, great places made straight. So, these are the three things. So, you can write that down. 
Warfare, uh, in, intercession, warfare, and repentance. Those are the key manifestations of the revival movement. But where I'm really going is this. The enemy also has a threefold attack on revival movements. Number one, the spirit of Jezebel. Because the spirit of Elijah is meant to arise, the spirit of Jezebel would also arise to oppose that spirit of Elijah. This is always the case. Jezebel, you know, pretty much um, um, ended Elijah's ministry. Jezebel pretty much beheaded John the Baptist. In case you didn't realize that was Jezebel, read the story again. It's the same spirit. Just like Elijah modeled a dimension in God, like no one had before him, Jezebel modeled a dimension in the demonic that no one had done to the degree she did it before she was on earth. Are you tracking with me? So she left, she, she died, and that dimension she modeled is named after her, the spirit of Jezebel. And it manifests with control, manipulation, intimidation, and perversions. She is the spirit behind all forms of sexual immoralities. But not just that, Oftentimes in a congregation like this, she would try to get close to leadership and inf influence and in all kinds of manipulative way to kind of bring that intimidation and control. Now, as a revival movement, you're probably going to deal with the spirit. In fact, you're going to deal with the spirit of Jezebel, whether in the control leadership dimension or in the perversion of immorality dimension. All those dimensions, she oversees them. If as a church you start to push intensely in intercession and in warfare and repentance, you would overcome that. Because God is going to give you wisdom. That's one of the things that prayer does. As you pray, you receive intelligence from heaven, strategies for war. That's why it says in Psalms, blessed be the Lord my God who trains my hands for war. Yeah. Yeah. He is the one that teaches you to war. I mean, you can read a book on spiritual warfare, but the warfare you're going through, there's specific ways to overcome in that battle. See, the, the Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, right? And every tongue that rises against you in judgment is condemned. Now listen, it said no weapon formed. So there are specific weapons that are formed for specific people. The weapons that are formed for you may be different, in fact, will be different to the weapons that are formed for me. But the enemy has a factory where he forms weapons for people. So if he's going to form a weapon, I can't just, uh, it, 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 how do I word this? It's good to learn principles from people, but the ultimate teacher is the Holy Spirit. So one thing I say is, you may be dealing, I may be going through a kind of spiritual battle right now, and because I'm pressing into God and repentance, intercession, and you know all that, the Lord gives me strategies as to how to fight. Now, you hear my story and you want to apply the same strategies, but the weapons he released against you are different to the one he released against me. <laughs> are you tracking with me? So you need to seek the Lord, and he begins to train your hands for war. Because how are you going to fight your battle, even though there might be overarching principles that are similar, but there will be unique differences in the direction of the Holy Spirit. Some Christians just want principles, but don't want to press into presence. In presence is where you receive strategic secrets that are applicable just to you. And it works for you, but someone else may try it and it might not work for them. I could pray in tongues for four hours and some things happen to me, but the fact that you pray in tongues for four hours doesn't mean the same thing that happened to me when I did is going to happen to you. Because, are you tracking with me? God deals with us individually. Based on his calling on our lives, the assignment on our all sorts of variables affect the dealings of the Lord with us. The same applies in the demonic. The enemy has specific weapons. You know the Bible says the enemy goes to and fro the whole earth? Uh, I believe he asked in Job or somewhere, somewhere around there where he's going to and fro. The Lord asked him, where have you been? He had been going to and fro. We think of that as left and right, just going to and fro. But that's not just the dimension. The enemy travels up and down. In other words, he travels from now into your bloodline, into your history. Your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-great-great-grandfather. He travels up and down your bloodline looking for legal ground to bind you now based on things they did back then. So the enemy travels. He's a deep researcher. 
there's no one alive in this place. <laughs> so that's why you need spiritual intelligence and you can afford to be spiritually dull and not have a prayer life. I don't know how you're going you're gonna to be effective in this culture, in this region, without a strong prayer life. Because this is a revival movement, and for you to break through into the things God's called you to do, your prayer has to be hot like never before. And I'm telling you, you a lot of you, some of you do pray in here, but I'm, there needs to be a shift in the, in the, in the, in the heat. <laughs> the, the prayer temperature needs to rise. For the kind of demonic things you're dealing with, this fire destroys everything, literally, just depending on the level of the heat. So you see this metal? I can put fire next to it and nothing happens just because the fire has not got to a certain temperature. The more I increase the temperature, there's going to be a temperature where that metal melts. So if that metal is not melting and there's fire, it means the temperature is not high enough to melt it. So if you're dealing with stuff in this region and it's not melting, guess what? The fire is not hot enough. If it's not falling, turn up the heat. If it's not moving, it's because things need to shift in the intensity and the tenacity of the prayer. Okay, I've labeled that point enough. So the three dimensions are the Jezebelic dimension, which manifests in control, manipulation, intimidation, perversion. The witchcraft dimension is number two, which manifests in depression, unexplained mental confusion, is, you see, people say, oh, yeah, it's just, a mental, it's just a chemical imbalance. I do know that there could be biological issues that cause men, uh, what's it, chemical imbalances that affect emotions. What I'm talking about right now is not that. Some of you know what I mean. It's a demonic depression. It brings a clouding of your imagination. It's like just what happened to Elijah. The enemy takes over your mind. It's witchcraft in nature. By the way, Jezebel also operates a lot of witchcraft, in case you didn't know. <laughs> so, depression, unexplained sicknesses. Doctors can't find what's going on. and just weird things going on in your body. And also, in addition to that, you see patterns in your bloodline that are just weird. Like all the women in your bloodline never get married, or they get married, they always get divorced. Or people get to 21 and something happens. Or people get to 50 and they get cancer. Everyone in your family, or everyone, every, every man in the family, this happens. Every woman in the family, this happens. When you begin to see those patterns, there's demonic programming behind it. Can we talk about things like this at church? <laughs> when you see those patterns, no, something is responsible for that. It doesn't just happen. We can share more stories, but because of time, we're not going to go into that. Hearing voices, demonic delays, there are regions where the church can't grow beyond a certain number. The church gets to 200, they split. Or the church gets to 200, the pastor falls and something weird happens. Or they get church to 200, something always, in fact, I was with a pastor like that recently in New Jersey, same thing. Whenever the church gets to a certain level, something happens. Or the pastor has a mental breakdown or something, a break, something always. When you see those patterns, if you're going to be the next pastor, you, you, you better realize your fire needs to be hot. <laughs> Preaching is not going to shift that pattern. You're going to have to dig in the place of prayer and make sure the heat you're generating, according to James 5, the effective fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available. You better make a lot of power available in your personal and corporate prayer to overthrow that pattern. Because the enemy is very jealous over his territories and he's going to fight for it until someone rises to, chal to challenge him. Okay, so that's witchcraft, number two. Number three, and this is where I'm going to land. The religious spirit. I believe this is probably the strongest thing that you guys are dealing with in this culture. In fact, as I'm, as I'm speaking to you, like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you, the, the reason why I'm doing that, I'm not just doing that as a preacher thing, because many of you don't do this on the platform. When you stand up here on the platform and speak, you can feel people differently to when you're sat down. So... I can feel sometimes a resistance and a block. And I'm telling you, in this territory, there's a, there's a religious spirit. And it's infiltrated into this church. And so the revival movement that's meant to come out of this church 
will not come out until you deal with the spirit within. Can I, can I go somewhere here? Do you remember Moses? He was in the desert and he had an encounter with God. And in the encounter, God told him to put his rod down. When he put his rod down, what happened? He turned to what? A snake. Why? Have you noticed Pharaoh's throne? Do you know Pharaoh's throne and that thing he puts on is in the shape of a cobra? Read the Egyptian history. Snakes and that type of snake is like one of their main gods. In fact, Pharaoh put on a snake, as in the shape of a snake, in honor of that spirit. So the spirit that was keeping the people of Israel in captivity was this snake-like spirit ruling through Pharaoh. So when God encountered Moses, his rod turned to a snake. And tell, I don't know much about snakes, and I do hate snakes, by the way. And I know you don't pick snakes up by their tail. When God told him to pick up the snake, what did he do? He picked it up by itself, showing us that God was giving him authority over the snake. Moses was called as the deliverer of the people of God in captivity to the snake. But he had to overcome the snake spirit in the desert before he could be sent back to the people to break up the bondage of the snake spirit over them. Are you hearing me today? You cannot deliver the region from the spirit, from the religious spirit if you don't break its influence over you right here, right now. Some of you are speaking to you and you're thinking, oh, well, this message is not for me. It is for you. Amen. The devil will try to mesmerize you and think, oh, yeah, this is not for you. It's for another person over there. Well, I wish that person was here in church. No, it's for you. It's for you. It's for you. Because the nature of deception is, the nature of deception is, the people deceived don't know they're deceived. And I'm here as a voice crying out to you, don't waste your destiny as a church. Don't get stuck in the religious spirit. Don't just come to church and listen to a sermon. God is wanting you to be part of a movement of his spirit. The religious spirit manifests by pride, hypocrisy, having a form of godliness but denying its power. The religious spirit manifests by honoring what God has done while dishonoring what he's doing. Always criticizing. Have you noticed Jesus saved some of his fiercest rebukes for who? The religious leaders. So the religious spirit opposes the move of God. John the Baptist faced the religious spirit. And he gave us a, a, a picture of what that spirit looks like in the spirit realm. He called the Pharisees brood of vipers. It's a snake-like spirit. Vipers, if I understand them correctly, like to camouflage themselves and hide. So they can come. Now, by the way, we're talking about a spirit, not people. But spirits work through people. So people under the spirit would come to church, do the church stuff, but the spirit is working within them. And so when that spirit starts to be challenged, like I'm doing and other preachers will probably do, anger, resentment starts to rise. That is a manifestation because the spirit does not like being exposed. It's full of pride. It always wants to be right. Someone functioning in the spirit or in the religious spirit is not humble. They're always right. They know best. They know better than the pastor. They've been a Christian for 30 years and oh, somehow they know everything. But their life doesn't show it. They have no fruit. They just have talk, talk, criticisms all the time. And they come to church, it's time to pray, and they're like this. Disengaged, not connected, no heart. And then the, the one that's been the Christian the longest in the room. Maybe even, they, they, they might just have become a Christian a few weeks ago. But the point is, there is no engagement. There, there is no real heart connection with God. It's all either mental or just word-based, but you can't detect hearts connected. They worship me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. That is the religious spirit. I'm telling you guys, listen, I might not be invited back here, so I'm going to give you everything right now. 
And you're not going to intimidate me because I'm not here to please you. I'm here to tell you what I believe God is saying. Your region, your region is heavy under the religious spirits. And some of you have been influenced by it and don't know it. So you're just doing the church stuff, but you have no hunger for God. Your heart is not connected. You're, I'm sorry to say this, but I'm going to say what comes to me. You're a hypocrite. Because you're doing the stuff in the outside, but really your life is a complete double life. But you know how to put on the form of godliness. You are hindering the move of God in this place. You have two options. Repent or move on. Pastor Mark did not ask me to say this. I'm not the pastor, so I'm going to say this, and Pastor Mark can come and sort out the mess later. (laughs) Because if you're not going to change, you're going to become a blockage to what God wants to do. That is why the spirit of revival has repentance as a key part of its core. I repent often, but the religious spirit is not one to repent because it's never wrong. Always fighting, resisting the move of God. Look at the Pharisees. You criticize the Pharisees in the scriptures. You're like, oh, they were horrible people. But you're doing the same thing they did. You want to take out the log out of your brother's eye, or the speck out of your brother's eye, and then you're not taking out the log in your own. You're looking at everyone else, pointing fingers, but you're not looking at your own attitude. And then when you're challenged, you flare up, and you, you're always... And, see, you have to become self-aware. Some of you are manifesting, but you don't know you're manifesting. As in manifesting the spirit that's influencing you. When Jesus was sensing that Peter was manifesting, you know what he said? Get behind me, Satan. Do you know how Peter was manifesting? He was telling Jesus not to go to the cross. So he was manifesting a spirit with his words. Why, why did Jesus tell Peter, get behind me, Satan? Or in fact, let's just back that up. Why did Peter tell Jesus not to go to the cross? Because what Jesus was rebuking was Peter's desire, which seems right. Because Jesus was saying to Peter and the disciples, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. And Peter was like, far be it from you. You're not going to die. You, you should not die. So He was trying to stop Jesus from doing something that you think, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus discerned the spirit. See, this is the religious spirit. It camouflages itself in things that sound nice and logical. But what was really behind Peter's words was selfishness. Because he wanted to reign and rule with Jesus. Because he knows the Messiah is going to reign and rule. And he's one of the closest friends of the Messiah. In fact, the disciples are fighting about who's going to sit on his left and on his right. And now the same Messiah says he's going to die. No, Jesus, you're not going to die. I'm going to reign with you. So he might not have said, I'm going to reign with you. But he said, no, you don't have to die. No, you don't have to die. But see, the weakness in his flesh gave his flesh a platform to express the voice of Satan. Because he was not dealing with his flesh. See, this is how religious spirits are. When you don't get into the presence of God for him to deal with your flesh and you repent, you become a voice to articulate the spirit that's operating in the region. Are you hearing me? A fish in water does not know it's wet. Because that's all it's always known. When you've lived in a region that's under the influence of a religious spirit for so long, you can be so under it, you don't even know it's functioning. Just like a fish in water. It, it's, your norm, it's just like the way life is over here in North Carolina. It, it just, it's just the way it is. But you have no idea that you're functioning under a spirit that's hindering the move of God. And until you consciously stand against it, you will be subconsciously influenced by it. There's no middle ground. If you're not consciously resisting, you are subconsciously being influenced. So this church will not fulfill its destiny and purpose if you as a congregation don't rise up in agreement against the religious spirit. It's ruling and influencing this territory, but you've got to start by saying it will not influence this church. And it starts... By you saying, Lord, I repent for where I have entertained the religious spirit. 
Now, I'm going to do an illustration, and then we're going to wrap up. My time is gone, but I need to show you something. So I need a volunteer up here. Anyone wants to volunteer? Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you or anything. You just need to hold this paper for me. I need a volunteer. Thank you, sir. Do you want to come up? Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Uh, can, you, can you hold this paper like as I'm doing? Just hold it apart like that. Okay, hold it up as well. So this paper represents the, pre, uh, the atmosphere over the region. And when you live under here, you pick up the atmosphere. So your soul, you know, a radio um, is able to pick up radio frequencies that already exist in the atmosphere. But the radio is able to give expression to those frequencies. The fact that you don't hear them does not mean they're not there. If you had a radio receiver, it picks it up and expresses it. Your soul is like a radio receiver. It picks up the frequency, the spiritual frequency in the air. And if your soul is not under the government of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2 tells us you live according to the prince and the power of the air. So your soul picks up what's happening, and then you express it in your lifestyle. So if we're going to know the spirit ruling in a region, we have to look at the lifestyles of the people in that region because their lifestyles give expression to the, prime, to, to the uh, uh, predominant spirit ruling in that place. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. So imagine this is your church over here, and you start to pray. First off, I said it, you need to repent and make sure you have no connection to the uh, religious spirit and you're a church of intercession, you're a church of spiritual warfare. Those are key for breaking through what's in this region. So you start to pray. This is what happens with your prayers. Your prayers starts to poke through the atmosphere. But the problem is, when you start, you don't see the breakthroughs. In fact, it feels like nothing is changing. And bear in mind, we're dealing with spirits. They don't sleep and they don't get tired. So when you get tired and go to sleep, they're still working. So when you start praying and you're making this sort of breakthroughs, you might not know you're making breakthroughs and you might get discouraged and think nothing is happening. So you stop praying. And when you stop praying, they go and cover the ground that you've already gained. This is why consistency in prayer is absolutely key for true revival. So one you're cleansed by repentance, you live a life of intercession, and you keep fighting in the spirit through spiritual warfare. As the Lord trains your hands for battle and war. This is what happens. Your prayers keep poking through, and if you don't give up, eventually what's going to happen is a breaking. Thank you, sir. When that breakthrough happens... No one has to tell you the breakthroughs. You as a church will know it. You're going to come in here on Sunday. The atmosphere will be completely different. Your worship will be very different. Things will begin to happen in this place that have never happened before. People will start to come in here that have never come in here. Things will, you, you're going to begin to sense the momentum. I'm telling you, your pastors are hungry for a move of God. Don't hold them back by embracing the religious spirit. While the leadership are crying out for God, but the congregation don't want it, but they want to just do church as normal and just do their Super Bowl and do sports and do everything else, but just have Jesus as a bit of a part of their life, just making their life better. No, he wants to take over your life. He doesn't just want to be something in your life that just makes you better. Uh, a lot of the things that Christians pray for today, Satan can give them. You want a house? Satan will give you a house. Oh, you want a husband? He will send you a husband. You want a wife? Satan will send you a wife. Oh, you want money? You want business? He will give it to you. So could it be that some Christians are thinking, thanking God for breakthroughs that the Satan gave them? Because he knows that once he gives them that breakthrough, they're going to be distracted from God. And they're not going to seek true revival because the spirit of religion makes you comfortable and sleepy. Comfortable people don't change history. So God wants to make you uncomfortable. This sermon or this preach is making many of you uncomfortable. That's good. Because it's shaking you out of your... I feel like, I'm a, I feel like I am an alarm clock that's come here. and just like, wake up! Wake up! Don't just sit there and let the enemy bombard your mind. Wake up. Witchcraft has come against some of you in this church. 
And you know the things happening with you are unusual, unusual sickness patterns. Because when you begin to press through in the spirit like that illustration, and Satan starts to see your progress, he's going to start to release intimidations. Sometimes it's in sicknesses to shut you down, to discourage you. But it's just the enemy reacting. There are altars of wickedness in this region that are very strong, resisting the altar of righteousness. So we better make the fire on this altar destroy every other altar. Are you cracking with me today? My assignment here today is to expose the religious spirit and to call you to repentance. It doesn't matter whether you think you're guilty or not. Just say, Lord, every inward toleration. By the way, can I have the band come back up, please? <laughs> My time is up. Every inward toleration of the spirit of religion or the religious spirit. Father, cleanse me from that. Yes. Cleanse me from... Just stand with me right now. Jesus, Now, I want you to pray. In your own words, turn to God in repentance. I mean, sincerity, not just repeating words. But be honest. Say, Lord, I am sorry for entertaining the spirit, the religious spirit. I'm sorry for pride in my heart. I'm sorry for where I've embraced the, the, the primary ruling spirit in this territory. And I've not realized I've become a victim of it. Lord, I repent. I turn away from, from that form of godliness that denies the power. I turn away from, from that sleepy, complacent Christianity that's dead and dull. Lord, I turn away from that. Listen, don't just think this prayer. Speak it out. You don't have to be loud, but speak it out to the Lord in all sincerity. We're going to break the influence of this thing right here. Because there's more the Lord has called this church to. So, Father, we break agreement with the religious spirit. We break agreement with the works of darkness in all its manifestation. We expose that kind of, uh, that, that camouflaging viper spirit, like a snake that hides, but actually resists the move of God. We say no to the religious spirit in this territory, influence in this congregation. No more, no more, no more in the name of Jesus. Come on, band, help me out. I need some sound here. Play. Come on, if you can pray in the spirit, take a few moments. Let's begin to pray in the spirit right now. Come on, listen. This is not the time to be quiet. This is the time to speak, to pray, to resist, to renounce, to release declarations against everything of darkness that you may have agreed with, knowingly or knowingly. Aya vanda hasotola vale kepaya. Vale, vale, vale sonayo. Vale, vale, vale sonayo. Vale, vale sonayo. Aya sana mayanayo. Vekatala namanayo. Remanaina namanayo. Hazole, hazole, hazole onayo. Hazole, hazole, hazole onayo. Masatale de bababa. Ramamana namana namana namana. Ramana namana namana namana. Ramana mana namana namana namana. Ramamana na vesa tale de ba. Ramamana na vesa tae. Rebazana nae. Remamana ye. Remanaye, 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 Avasata Mikebanoi, Avasata Levanoi, Evaladai, 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 Come on, lift your voice. Hey. Come on, release yourself. Pray, 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 pray.
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus is 
Jesus.